we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Shifts Health and Nature webinar series. We're kicking it off with chapter one, the health and nature movement. And we are so happy today to have Michael Sook, who is presenting about the topic nature and medicine. And just to give you a brief um, introduction to me, um, I'm the principal scientist for Middle Path Eco Solution, um, an, a, business, a small consulting company that helps businesses and organizations align better to their community. I'm also a research scholar and the community director for the Ronan Institute for Independent Scholarship. It's an institute that provides a home for researchers and scholars working outside of the typical mortar and brick institutes like universities and federal research labs. And I'm a social ecologist by training. Previously, I've worked in international conservation and development. I've done research on topics like traditional medicine, forest management, non-timber forest products, livelihood strategies. And today I continue doing research on topics like community resilience, ecological, social ecological management approaches, scientific data use by the public, market value chains, and career development for higher education. And so with these skills and this, this, and this background shift has asked me to coordinate, to develop and to co-develop and coordinate this webinar series in, in, um, in coordin um, partnered with, with Shift. And so I'm your host today. Um, I would like to introduce, um, oh, sorry. Um, this is the series, about the series. So um, the series, the Shift in Health Nature webinar series brings together innovators, opinion leaders, and researchers at the forefront of the health and nature movement to help advance our understanding of the public health benefits of time spent outside. And overall, this series aims to stimulate cross-sectoral learning and promote broader mainstream adoption of the health benefits of contact with the natural world. And in this first chapter, entitled The Health and Nature Movement, it will be held during all of this month of March, so there's only there's two webinars, um, providing a high-level overview of the opportunities and challenges facing different stakeholders of the health and nature movement. And in these presentations, we hope to foster cross-sectoral understanding of the connection between health and nature as a first step toward transdisciplinary advancement of the field. And the subsequent chapters, chapters two, three, four, and five, will present a deeper exploration of the topic from the perspective of different stakeholder communities. And, and these will be public health, conservation, land management, and outdoor recreation. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Christian Beckwith, the director of SHIFT. Thank you, Erika, and um, it's a pleasure to have you on our very first one. We're very excited to have all the folks who are joining us as well. So I'm the executive director of SHIFT. It's a 501c3 nonprofit based out of Jackson, Wyoming. And our mission is to strengthen the coalition of interests dedicated to the protection of the natural world. We achieve this via two main programs, the SHIFT Summit, which is an annual gathering that we hold every autumn in Jackson Hole. It explores issues at the intersection of outdoor rec, conservation, and public health and the Emerging Leaders Program, which trains early career leaders to help develop our work at SHIFT and in America. So at last year's SHIFT, Dr. Rooney Botnagar, the director of the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute, and Dr. Terry Horton, who's with us here today, an associate professor of research at Northwestern University, worked with researchers from around the country to develop a knowledge network with which to advance and promote the health benefits of time outside one element of that effort resulted in the Slack channel that you can see at, um, on Slack at Shift Nature Health, and that's meant to be a communication hub for researchers working on the topic. Another development that came out of that meeting in uh, Jackson in October is what you're seeing here today. And this is the very first one of the Health and Nature webinar series. What we're trying to do with this first episode is provide a 30,000 foot view on the state of the movement, some of the opportunities and the gaps that in the evidence base that are before us. The other thing that we're trying to do with this, as Arika pointed out, was bring together some of the thought leaders at the very, um, at the head of the movement who have been pioneering some of the advances over the course of the last couple of decades and bring them in to help inform the conversation for the benefit of the rest of us. The Health and Nature webinar series is built in part to help with the evidence base. So what we were hearing from the researchers last year was that often their work took place in some sort of isolation. So by bringing it together with folks who are at the forefront in public health, in business, in outdoor rec, and land management and conservation, 
we're hoping to be able to shine a light on some of the practical applications of their, of their work, as well as where they might be able to focus for more impact. And importantly for us, this is a real opportunity to, to illuminate the, uh, what we're calling the health and nature constellation. So in all of these different sectors, whether it's outdoor rec, conservation, land management, public health, education, we're seeing folks like Dr. Sook who are real champions of the movement. And what we're often seeing is that these really bright lights, if you're flying around like a satellite and looking down at the US, these bright lights are uh, these tiny little dots of light that have so much potential to illuminate and underscore the, the opportunities that are ahead of us, but they're not necessarily synced up. Often they're siloed. So what we're trying to do with SHIFT is bring them together into a network and create a movement that can really help to elevate the importance of nature as a public health intervention strategy. And so Dr. Sook, a couple of years ago, came to SHIFT. He's become an advisor. He's actually on our advisory council now. Uh, we're honored to have him both as an advisory council member, but then also as our first speaker for this year's, uh, for this first Health and Nature webinar. Dr. Sook, MD, JD, MPH, MBA, FACS, is one of the country's earliest and leading proponents of the health benefits of time outside. Dr. Sook is currently the system-wide chairman of the Geisinger Musculoskeletal Institute for, for the Geisinger Health System and a board trustee for the American Medical Association. Chosen in 2003 as a White House fellow with the U.S. Department of the Interior, Dr. Sook, as special advisor to former U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Gail Norton, co-wrote a law review piece that investigated the relationship between a healthy lifestyle and participating in outdoor activities such as bicycling, hiking, and camping. In 2011, Dr. Sook's activism in this matter contributed to the National Park Service's adoption of a number of key values in the centennial call to action, preparing for a second century of stewardship and engagement. So to help us understand the scope of the health and nature movement, We've asked Dr. Sook to provide that high level overview of nature as a public health intervention strategy, including ways we can elevate the importance of time outside as a positive determinant of healthcare outcomes. This presentation is being recorded for later distribution via the researchers Slack channel, the shift networks, and the distribution channels of our partner organizations. We ask participants to mute their microphones and turn off their video for its entirety. And following Dr. Sook's presentation, there will be a 10 minute Q&A session. Participants are asked to post their questions in the group chat and include their names, titles, and the organizations they represent. Dr. Sook, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, uh, Arika, for uh, inviting me to participate in this very unique panel. Uh, as uh, many of you on the uh, webinar, I have had a chance to meet some of you. I can see some of the names. It's great to see all of you again. Uh, many of you know that it's been, uh, for me, a uh, journey of uh, continuing to uh, participate in the world of health and nature. I think my video just came back on. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to be with you today. So as Christian has mentioned, uh, you know, this movement about nature and medicine or nature as medicine has really taken off, I think, uh, more so in the last couple of years than perhaps even in the decade before that. And it's a real pleasure to be part of it, uh, share with you some of my thinking of it, uh, some of the advocacy that I've been participating in uh, and uh, in helping to bring people along. So just starting with this, we'll take a 30,000 foot journey through the science of where nature is helpful in uh, individual health, uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we can go and where the opportunities lie, <clears throat> and then hopefully answer some questions. And as a healthcare professional and a provider, uh, one who works in a fairly integrated uh, healthcare system, we can talk about health, nature as a social deter determinant of health uh, and uh, strategies to, for, to uh, continue to move that forward. Um, so the real question that I begin with uh, in this question of head, nature as medicine, and we can hit the next slide, is really this question that starts with uh, what happened to our connection to the outdoors? Next slide. And so when you think about it, uh, for me, it really started with this question very early on to try to understand why is it that outdoors, uh, you know, the outdoors was such a foreign place for so many people. 
Uh, and as society and civilization moved on, why we began to lose that connection with the outdoors. I put this slide and this picture up because it reminds me of kind of the evolution of what our connection is to the outdoors. And uh, today, uh, in today's world, next slide, please. Uh, you know, we've gotten to the point where that we've essentially engineered the outdoors out of our uh, daily lives, particularly among children. Uh, to the point where seven and a half hours a day uh, or less are spent uh, outside in unstructured activity. 30% of kindergarten classrooms have eliminated recess uh, altogether. And so if it starts uh, at that level uh, and that early on, we know that the connection to the outdoors can become something as an adult much harder to regain. And so it then asks the, the next question in terms of what is it about the outdoors that we actually think is uh, contributing to our own individual and uh, uh, individual and uh, health. And so it began a review of things, uh, the science behind the health benefits of nature. And we know that our studies among children uh, and lots of epidemiological studies, next slide, uh, have demonstrated that uh, kids uh, ultimately are smarter uh, as a proportion to the amount of time that they spend outside, next. Uh, we know that it provides them with greater concentration skills, uh, greater skills in self-discipline, uh, greater language and collaborative skills, and awareness and reasoning and observational skills. And so we know that by just reviewing, uh, comparing co cohorts of children, uh, that uh, we can make them smarter. We can also find evidence that shows that uh, participation in activities outside also makes them stronger. Uh, and in this context, they have advanced motor skills and fitness. Uh, next coordination, balance, and agility. And it can buffer the impact of life stress on children and helps them ultimately deal with adversity. So it makes them better citizens, makes them physically stronger as well. Next slide. Studies among children also show that, uh, that kids ultimately end up what we would call better. Uh, next, in the sense that it reduces or eliminates bullying, uh, can enhance the powers of observation and creativity, uh, really enhances their ability to be positive citizens, and enhances their ability to be independent and autonomous. And so given this evidence, one would say that nature is, should be a very prominent place in the way we educate and raise our, our children. But when we look at adults and we look at other areas of science, we focus a lot of our studies on things like uh, within uh, the brain. And some of the evidence shows that uh, if you spend time in nature, you actually have an enhanced ability to uh, increase your short-term memory. And in fact, when they do studies of people who spend time outside, they actually uh, more finely cut the onion. They say that walking in nature is actually the best way to enhance your short-term memory. And the way they describe this is that studies between people who are spending time outside in urban environments versus natural environments, they think that trees and fields actually beat roads and lampposts in terms of enhancing your short-term memory. We also know that it can help with uh, aspects of depression. Uh, and we know, and I think most of us probably on this webinar understand that when you're feeling down or when you're feeling uh, particularly depressed, uh, you may be able to go outside and actually have an elevation of spirit. Uh, but scientifically, it's shown that it can improve your memory and it can also improve your mood. Now, other studies that have been out there over the last uh, couple decades have demonstrated that if you're, uh, with regard to depression, next slide, uh, that moving near a park actually can actually play an important role. Next. So in this, in one particular study, they showed that city dwellers are more likely to suffer from mental health disorders than people who weren't born and raised in an urban environment. And that actually moving closer to verdant sections of a city uh, can actually produce long lasting mental health benefits. And then in this study in the UK on a six year national longitudinal study, it basically showed that for every group of people that move closer to parks and gardens, they ended up having uh, greater air aspects of mental health, uh, uh, study, uh, mental health performance. Uh, also enhancing this idea that being part and close to a green or a vertical area is helpful. Next slide. We also know within the brain functions and studies and psychological studies, they can renew, it can reduce mental fatigue and inspire awe, awe which is a very interesting uh, definition. Next. Uh, in the sense that mental energy can bounce back just by looking at pictures of nature. And so many of your colleagues who may sit in cubicles, they actually put nice pictures of national parks next to their uh, cubicles where they're indoors in order to feel better. Uh, we also know that awe, this sense of awe, expands people's perceptions of time, enhances well-being, and causes people to behave more altruistically and less materialistically. 
uh, all, I think, citizenship questions that we would say are truly just the benefits of being near or outside. And there are two things that are really needed for a true awe experience. And this is idea of perpetual vastness than the need for accommodation, which is essentially saying, I have to be, I, I'm not able to understand the vastness that I see. And so that awe inspiring type of activity or uh, vistage uh, can actually add to your uh, ability to reduce mental fatigue. Next. So when we look at parks, we also look at uh, mental performance. And we know that if you're stuck on an idea, uh, you have the ability to enhance your ability to work through that idea. Next. And that green space is less what we call brain fatigue. And if you think about brain fatigue for a second, it is essentially uh, going through an area that's so congested like in an urban environment. And you know that your mind get ti gets tired, for example, if you're walking through the streets of New York City uh, versus walking through a park. And part of it is because your alertness and your ability for your brain to accommodate all the things that are going on gets very tired and very quickly uh, and, uh, and very quickly. And so this can also enhance uh, being a, in a park and enhance your ability to relax and re rest. And it's this idea of distracted mental att attention, things like constantly worrying whether a, a taxi cab is coming around the corner versus this idea of soft, soft fascination, the idea of looking at a natural environment and trying to understand it. Next slide. So then we go beyond the physiological or psychological. We look what's actually happening in the brain. And so the translation between some of the psychological science into the basic science is actually very important. Next. And we know that in fact that actually being in nature uh, can result in uh, levels of uh, hemoglobin dropping in the, uh, in the prefrontal cortex, meaning that the executive function of your brain switches off a few of the lights. And essentially this means that you're, you're, you're f uh, able to focus and able to not be uh, uh, fatigued by making executive decisions all the time. And the, the rise in the insula and the basal ganglia also are associated with emotion and in play, uh, uh, rise in uh, enhanced emotion, pleasure, and empathy. And so the same hemoglobin rises in different areas within the brain. Uh, we all know this physiologically. We know this when we go outside, but actually having the science to prove it is actually very important. As we move past the brain into the next area, we also look at uh, effects with regard to uh, immunity. Uh, and we know that, uh, that your immune cells actually react differently when you spend time in nature. So natural killer cells, uh, intracellular granulus, granulosin, or perforin, these are all enzymes that are within the body that are associated with high immunity or ability to fight off disease. And by being exposed to nature, just simply by being outside, we know that they stay re remained elevated for 30 days, uh, up to 30 days later. And these were done in experiments on human beings, people who spend little time in nature and then they got exposed outside and they had a pre-test and a post-test, which would inc include a blood test. And I think those are difficult studies to perform, but now that we have that data, it's actually very helpful. We also know that it can play a role in inflammation. And this is a curious thing because this, these are the same enzymes that result uh, that can be elevated in things like cancer. Uh, and so when you have inflammation, you have high levels of interleukin-6 or tumor necrosis factor A. And that we know that studies based on nature, or at least nature exposure can reduce these, uh, these uh, uh, factors. And the question is whether or not it uh, has the ability to then uh, enhance your own individual health in that way. Next slide. Many of you may be familiar with Shinrin Yoku, which is the, uh, the art of forest bathing. Uh, and the interesting thing about forest bathing as an Eastern Asian uh, activity is that it's not the activity that's so important in terms of the description, but more so why it is that it actually has an effect and some of the theory behind it. So next slide. So we know that 5 million years have passed since the evolutionary origin of man, and 99.9% .9 of our evolutionary history has been spent in the natural environment. So essentially, most of our entire history, the history of man is spent outside, yet the 0.01% that we now spend in modern times is spent inside, which is a total insult to the way we were actually evolutionary, evolutionarily uh, developed. So we live in a society characterized by urbanization and artificiality, despite our physiological functions still being adapted to nature. And this is the thought process behind how things like exposure through forest bathing can be helpful to one's individual health. So as we move beyond the, uh, what, is, uh, what seems to be a more clear definition of uh, the impact of outside activities or nature-based activities 
on individual health, we have to wonder why it is that the healthcare professionals have had such a hard time adopting this message or incorporating into our own individual healthcare provider lives. Next. And if you look at the communication that exists, next, the leisure field uh, has been traditionally focused on things like psychological processes, the things that we spoke about, how you feel uh, as a result of being outside in nature versus what's actually happening. And so the studies that show actually cellular change and cellular enhancement or inflammation reduction, inflammatory cell reduction, haven't been done to the same level as the psychological studies. And so public health and medicine oftentimes rely on more hard science than they do on the softer sciences, uh, things like how you feel. And so as a result, this communication gap has existed to, uh, to, that allows physicians and people who are medically trained to be a little bit more skeptical of the softer sciences and find it, and have it very difficult time actually prescribing alterations in behavior in order to enhance and enhance uh, individual health through those interactions. The issue is in outside, and this is one of the particular things that I learned when I was at the uh, Department of the Interior uh, working as a White House fellow, is understanding the roles and activities and what you can actually do outside was very important. And if you look at the uh, messaging that comes out of outdoor recreation, next slide, you can say, see that the recreation mission is very different than what it is in the medical world. So being outside, being active in a medical sense is oftentimes connoted with going to the gym. Whereas we know that being outside as outdoor activity uh, activists, we know that the recreation message is very different. Next. And that's essentially go out and have fun. And so this particular link to physical activity, I think, is a powerful way where we can continue to enhance or encourage our medical professionals to uh, prescribe or at least participate in things that are active outdoors uh, and nature-based. Next slide. The issue in the public health sector world is essentially uh, the problem is that we know we can tell people to go burn uh, calories and ex expend metabolic uh, 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 units. Uh, but the activity and location is where public health, or I'm sorry, public lands uh, uh, participants and uh, managers can play an important role. Next, what the public health message fails to address is the how and where, and it's the where uh, and, and the act types of activities that can be critically important. This led me in the next slide to, to write this, uh, what I think is a fairly important article. This is back in 2004. Uh, what I wrote with uh, the sitting secretary of Gail Norton at the US Department of the Interior, that really talked about public lands and waters, uh, not necessarily as government entities, but as places where people can go and be outside as what I consider a very important gateway to better health. And that I think has spurred in many ways, a lot of discussions about the role of nature uh, on in one's individual health. Next slide. And what I meant by the gateway of public health uh, to, be to better health, uh, the gateway to, uh, to better health is essentially this, next. That, that it was well known that hiking, biking, and camping have the greatest longevity uh, than of any of the other human powered activities. And what a participation in these things did is it led to a whole host of other activities that were not seen as, uh, as forms of punishment as going to the gym, but other recreational activities that led to greater appreciation for the outdoors. And with the growing evidence, body of evidence that shows that being outdoors can actually en enhance your individual health, we think there's a good connection now to say that this is actually one of those prescriptions that we can do in order to enhance one's individual uh, profile in health. Next. We also knew that participating in, uh, in uh, activities as a, at a younger age uh, led to a longevity and a stickiness uh, to that type of activity. And that 90% of adult activities started between the ages of five, five and 18. So when you think about these things together, you think about both the idea of uh, the, starting with the question of what happened to our connection to the outdoors. And then you go into the growing body of evidence and scientific evidence that shows that actually nature and exposure can actually be good for your individual and physical health. And then you look at the things that we do when we are stewards of land and we can provide opportunities and access and places to be exposed to the air. Uh, exposed to uh, nature, we, we create a very powerful story about why nature and health makes a good connection. And so, next slide, uh, we talk about where there is opportunity now. And I think that looking back at my brief uh, kind of history with uh, activities in this, day, in, in, in this uh, particular regard, probably spanning back now two decades, I can tell you the world of appreciation for nature is very different today than it was when I first started. Uh, back then, it was an argument to say that nature is actually good for you. We didn't have a lot of evidence, but we said, doesn't it feel good? 
Today, we have a growing body of actual scientific evidence to say it feels good because of this. Today, also what we have is also a growing social movement around a recognition of the components of health and wellness. And this is largely accepted by the medical profession. If you go to the next slide. And we recognize today that the components of health and wellness overall actually uh, it has very little to do with the physicians and the hospitals that are part of a healthcare system. In fact, in order, in order for populations to be healthy, uh, we know that individual behavior comp comprises up to 40% of the overall health and wellness of an individual. Uh, these are things like smoking or obesity or activity levels and things like that, that if you have individual behaviors that lead to poor health, that contributes about 40% of the overall. Genetics are about 30%. So if you have a history of heart disease and things like that, these can be components uh, that will be taken into factors, uh, taken into account when we look at your overall health and that these social and environmental factors are comprised 20%. Now what's included in these things are things like access to food or access to housing. Uh, and we'll get to what that means ultimately, but hospitals and healthcare, really the smallest component of overall health and wellness, both of individuals and populations. The next slide. The next slide shows us what are a growing, uh, a, a growing term within the healthcare environment called the social determinants of health. And we look at those in the previous slide from the context of social and environmental factors. These are the things that we consider. Now, it's important to go through these. These are the six pillars that are largely accepted within components to health, uh, individual health and wellness. So things like economic stability, employment, income, expenses, debt, these can all contribute to your overall health and wellness. Education, whether you're literate or have access to schools. Uh, food, if there are food deserts within your environment, you know that it's gonna be harder to be healthier in that environment. The community and social context, this is social integration and support systems. And then of course the healthcare system, if you have no hospitals or no physicians in your area, then it is a contributor to the fact that overall your health and wellness can be impacted. But I'll bring your attention to the second one, which I think is really important. And this is the idea that your neighborhood and your physical environment is a critical factor to how our overall population health and wellness uh, can be uh, enhanced. And these are things like housing and transportation. But more importantly, now for the first time, physicians are speaking openly about this idea that parks and access to nature are an important social determinant of health. And what this does, it opens up the door for our continuing dialogue on where nature can play a role in individual health. Next slide. Back in 2004, uh, I was part of the original group that, uh, that helped write the treaties on what, uh, what eventually became the program for park prescriptions. And the idea here was that physicians played a role and we recognized there was a contributing factor in, of uh, being, having access to parks. And we wanted physicians to write paper prescriptions for, uh, for patients to access or at least participate or in activities in a park. That has evolved, I think, to uh, future to other things today where we now know that prescriptions necessarily may not be the appropriate or right way to do it in the sense that prescriptions tend to be more medicalized. Some patients don't like to get a prescription. If you write a prescription for someone to take a medication, it seems almost, seem almost like, uh, in some cases, like a punishment. And we think that, uh, in many ways, uh, participation and partnership with uh, outdoor uh, recreation and outdoor lands, uh, uh, public lands managers, I think, is more of a partnership than it is kind of a transactional uh, relationship. So I think that is starting to evolve as well. The other aspects that I think are important for physicians uh, when we look at um, the role of nature is actually very personal. If you go to the next slide, uh, I've been making the case that actually physicians themselves need nature interventions in the sense that we know that physicians in, in an increasingly uh, important way are being recognized for things like burnout. Uh, we know that the way we deliver care today is very different than we did it 20 years ago. We use a lot more electronic medical records. Uh, there are a lot more check boxes that we have to do. There's a lot more standardization that kind of affect what is overall the art of medicine. And so when you look at this idea of, of burnout among physicians, you'll see some startling statistics uh, that uh, a large portion of uh, pay, uh, physicians in America recognize uh, themselves or have been recognized as uh, feeling uh, aspects of burnout, which is things like hopelessness or really giving up in a sense of uh, no longer uh, wanting to participate in the profession. 65% of, uh, of uh, physicians uh, uh, in this particular survey were identified as having experienced aspects of burnout. 
It's very alarming if you're a patient. Next page. And so why is that important? So decreased quality of care is the top reason among healthcare professionals or healthcare organizations to address physician burnout. Because if you're burnt out delivering care, you're probably not going to be at the top of your game uh, delivering quality care. So this is part of that argument to say, well, what are we gonna do uh, to help address this particular aspect? Now, I've been one of the few who have been out saying that actually nature interventions can actually help physicians heal themselves. And if you go to the next slide, one particular startling statistics for you uh, as a result of uh, the mental drain that can occur uh, in uh, healthcare environments today. Most people don't know this particular statistic, but about one physician a day uh, commit suicide in the United States, and largely because of these aspects of helplessness, hopelessness within the practice of the profession. So I think that if there is an opportunity to link this particular idea that nature from a psychological process, we talked about how it can improve your mood, it can give you a reset, it can give you a very different outlook on life. Uh, one of the things that I've been proposing is the idea that nature is actually an intervention that physicians themselves need along with the regular population. The next aspect of uh, healthcare that's shifting uh, largely that is actually beneficial to the health and nature movement is, uh, next slide, is this idea of a shift toward value-based care. And this is an idea that uh, if we are able to provide better preventive care to patients uh, uh, early on, we can actually prevent both chronic disease and the acute need for interventions. This is an idea called population health. And so shifting toward value-based care would mean shifting dollars away from things that I do, for example, as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, to preventive types of procedures or preventive types of interventions that actually keep people healthy. And this is now, I think, an important aspect or an important role where nature as an intervention can now come to the fore. Longer outcome term outcomes are not immediately payable or easy to incent. So things like diabetes, rather than pay physicians to treat diabetes, Shouldn't we treat, shouldn't we be paying cohorts of populations to prevent diabetes? And that's things like providing access to good food or healthy, uh, healthy foods uh, within food deserts. And so uh, many interventions include things like fresh food pharmacies where, um, where there are particular food deserts in uh, urban areas. Uh, health systems like ours are providing food trucks to provide prescriptions for fruits and vegetables uh, in areas that haven't been seen that before. This is a different type of thinking that's occurring in healthcare today. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we talk about land management and the role for land management parks and recreation. I think this is where partnerships can be very important. And I look forward to some of the questions that may come up after the end of this to talk about strategies on how to do this. But I think there's new opportunities and more opportunities today to link uh, land sustainability, land management, and public health and physician engagement in ways that have never been done before. Next slide. And the other question is, how do we then incorporate, too, this idea of nature as a benefit of health insurance? And I've talked about this probably for the last two decades as a wish and a hope. And I think we're getting to the point where it actually may become a reality. Well, many insurers today are paying for things like Uber rides to physician visits. Why? Addressing this idea of the social determinant of transportation being a barrier to good health. Uh, in California today, some large health insurance networks are now paying for uh, a public housing. Why? Because housing is, a determinant, is an important social determinant of health. Other systems like ours are doing things like providing prescriptions and paying for fruits and vegetables, not traditional medicines, but in order to prevent uh, long-term problems down in the future. And so my hope and my dream would be that we are able to now incorporate this idea of access to parks or access to nature or enhancements to land uh, that will one day be part of our conversation with regard to uh, uh, health insurance uh, benefits as well. And so my final, slide, my final slide for you is next. And it talks about the idea or the opportunities that we have before us. And that's the idea to bring healthcare providers, insurers, outdoor enthusiasts, public land managers, and environmental stewards together for widespread solutions. And this is where I thank Christian and the rest of the team at SHIFT to providing us a real foundation and opportunity to have those conversations. Uh, I think moving it now to a really important advocacy and action ask is next. And we're going to move the shift from individual medical treatment uh, to communities focused on prevention. And we're going to ultimately try to redefine this common meaning of health and wellness. And so with that, I'll stop. And I hope there are some good questions. I'm happy to interact with anybody who's joined the webinar. Christian, I'll turn it back to you. Good evening, as always. Um, 
So I, I see I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you for this presentation and for being such a, a champion in the space. Uh, you've always given us such inspiration and uh, you've fed the fire very nicely. Folks, we're opening up the session to questions now. If you have questions, please drop them into the group chat. Uh, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And it's currently looking like it's called Q&A. And while we wait for some questions to come in, Dr. Sook, you know, I saw a lot of, um, a lot of your presentation was focused on the, the healthcare community with some focus on the outdoor recreation community. And I'm wondering where you see the biggest opportunities for uh, conservation related organizations to step into this, this exciting movement. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that it's all linked uh, like uh, parts of a chain. Uh, for me, uh, the journey along uh, this idea of uh, physician and individual health all the way through the chain through conservation starts with the idea that if you take care of people and if you use the land as part of that uh, care pathway, then people will ultimately begin to appreciate the land and then to have a different sense of what conservation is. So if you have, if nature, is, if nature and land uh, uh, use is part of the conversation, it's only natural that people who uh, find a beneficial use or at least a health benefit from it can ultimately lead to a greater conservation stance. And so I think that it is related and down uh, along the chain, but I think there's definitely a role for conservation organizations. Great. <clears throat> I'm curious what you find uh, most exciting about recent trends or, or developments in this health and nature space. Uh, what do you find of particular note? So for me, as I mentioned during the presentation, is this idea that we've kind of moved in recognition of the demand for hard basic evidence uh, from a kind of a soft science, psychological, I feel good when I'm in nature to actually having some uh, hard science that backs up what's physiologically happening. Uh, in the body with exposure to nature. I think those things are some of the biggest breakthroughs that we've had to perhaps get past some of the critics that say, you know, that's just a soft science, it's just a feel good thing. Uh, there's no real uh, hard science to back it up. The other part that I would say is that with that, I think that people um, perhaps with greater communication tools that we've had from before, uh, there are pockets of really true believers within the physician community that I think have now an, app, uh, an ability to actually get together, share the science and share the passion so that we have a greater movement ability now than we've had before. Wonderful. We have a question from Julie Bell. Is there evidence that quality of the natural environment impacts the, the level and type of health benefits, for example, wilder natural environments as opposed to manicured park or playground? Yeah, Julie, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Uh, I think throughout the talk that I've said, I think we're at the very beginnings of our, our, our evidentiary kind of journey when it comes to health benefits of nature. Um, I have not seen any studies that talked about uh, the difference between a manicured park uh, versus the, uh, the uh, you know, the Alaskan wilderness. Um, it's a tough question because I think that the aspects of connections to nature as an outdoor environment is really uh, the uh, extent to which we have the hard basic evidence. I'd be very curious, it'd be hard to conduct a study um, uh, of that nature as you can imagine, but it would be very interesting. I, and I'd be curious about your input as to whether your experiences uh, show that there are a difference between the folks who are exposed in those areas. That could be an interesting study. We've got some other great questions coming in. We have one from Eric uh, Krausik. How can the medical community begin to recognize the cradle to cradle benefit of natural home birth and death to shift our cultural messages about nature's place in those important life events? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's also a really good question. And uh, I would say that uh, there's a wide dichotomy in opinion when it comes to uh, uh, the place of birth or at least the circumstances around birth. We know, as I mentioned during the, uh, on the slide with our Shinrin Yoku and also the studies, is that we are evolutionarily not designed, uh, we're intended to have babies in hospitals under uh, bright artificial lights and things like that. Um, so I think our technology got ahead of perhaps where our, 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 our natural inclinations were. And I think we're seeing a movement within the OBGYN uh, communities to try to bring that back. And there's a greater natural birth movement uh, out there versus even things like cesarean section and surgical interventions. Um, I think the medical community is actually debating that pretty robustly on its own uh, today. 
Uh, and I think it takes participants like you to continue to advocate for those things to keep, uh, keep the argument going. We've got one from Ellie Stevens. What counts as nature? I work in a 1300 acre urban park and I wonder what those benefits of being outside, um, when those benefits kick in, what kind of outdoor space do you need to be in? Yeah, so our understanding is outdoors is outdoors. So even within the city like New York City, I mean, urban spaces that show green are considered a, a trigger a certain physiological effect just by, uh, by uh, using your visual acuity and your optics. Uh, and so there's no necessarily prescription for any specific type uh, or size or experience within nature, uh, but it's really the exposure to something natural and green that is more important than anything else. We've got Eva Garcia down in Brownsville, Texas. What are some of the first action steps that might be needed? Um, as a community leader who works with public land managers regionally and public health institutions, how can we better position ourselves to connect existing work to the nature benefits and the research? Yeah, this has been, this has been the big conundrum. I, I have shared with many folks that uh, you know, the true believers are not, uh, I, I don't have a problem convincing people in the uh, outdoor uh, space uh, of the natural connection to individual health. The hard part is actually my colleagues within medicine. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more skeptical and partly uh, because they, it's very hard to define an intervention. So for you, I think specifically in your community is I would look to see where are the healthcare resources in the community for you uh, today, whether you define and, and help and try to define the population, however, uh, however it works best for your community. So for example, if you're in a town of a, a million people or a city of a million people, it may be that the small township within that uh, community where there's a centrally located park may be the population you're trying to uh, affect initially. There may be also associated uh, a healthcare system or a hospital uh, or a group of physicians that may be nearby. Uh, I think that's a grassroots way to kind of grow uh, the particular interest uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, issue itself. The other thing I would share with you is try to, um, and I can provide, I've seen a number of questions here asking for references and things like that, which I will provide. I would also provide in that list uh, uh, a references to understanding the movement around value-based care uh, and trying to get uh, at least familiar with the language that physicians are speaking today and healthcare institutions are speaking today. Because having that uh, cross dialogue and using language that makes sense, uh, talking about nature as a social determinant of health or access to parks as a social determinant can really open, I think, different doors and hopefully find a champion within the health system as well. Wonderful. We've got a few more here. One from Christian Abilt, Abitso. How much of the health outcome effect of exposure in na nature is simply being in nature versus performing some sort of physical activity in a natural setting? Yeah, and uh, I saw. I, I can read the second part of the question too. So, uh, so the first part of your question with regard to uh, um, nature versus performing an act, the studies that we've seen is really purely about exposure to nature. Uh, it's about being outside. It's taking both the all five senses and having exposure uh, to an environment that's different than an artificial or indoor environment that triggers all of these physiological results. Um, the activity portion, I think, is a different form of participation in nature, and that's where we get into uh, the interventions that make sense. For example, that communication gap, or at least the messaging gap between uh, outdoor land managers and the medical community. This idea that I want you to go be active uh, from a physician tends to be I want you to go to a gym versus go outside and have fun at a different level and ultimately achieving the same level of physical activity. So really two different components. I think exposure in itself is, a, is in and of itself a, uh, a intervention that has physiological results. I think the next question or next part of your question is, uh, is has to do with study design. And that's where I think, uh, and this is the question of whether you can do a controlled, a case controlled study. Some people expose to nature, some people not. In the scientific world and the population world, it's really, really hard to find volunteers to do those things. Uh, and with the scientific rigor that's required for health-related research, things like uh, investigational research boards and things like that, it can be hard to help define an intervention and then withhold one from another. So these are things that we're continuing to, to, uh, to look at uh, in terms of the designing the right scientific studies that have the right scientific merit. Wonderful. We have a question from our friend at the National Park Service, Bob Ratcliffe. 
about what recommendations you might have to help us integrate the health and nature principles into the CDC's new initiative. The yeah, Active hi, Bob. Healthy Nation. Great to, see you. Great to see you there. So the CDC's new initiative, Active People, Healthy Nation, right, is an opportunity for us to, to get involved. I think because it's a governmental agency, uh, I think that using governmental influence to be part of those panels is important. Uh, I think however you can get access uh, or at least provide input into who should be advising that CDC panel. Uh, I was fortunate to be on an earlier CDC panel, a Healthy, Park, or a healthy, uh, a healthy People 2010. Uh, and so I helped write that and we did incorporate some of the nature principles in there. Uh, I think that uh, where there's opportunity from an intergovernmental nature, uh, you know, and, and Bob, in your case, I'd go to Dave Bernhardt and have him uh, recommend either myself or a handful of others to be part of the CDC panel. Uh, but uh, I think getting a believer or finding out who are the physicians on that, uh, I'm happy to chat with them and see if we can get that incorporated as well. Wonderful. We've got a few more. <clears throat> One from Abigail Ertel. Where do things like clean water and healthy forests fit into this discussion? Yeah, so, you know, again, this has to do with the conservation question that Christian asked earlier. And I think ultimately this idea of, uh, of uh, health benefits of nature, uh, recognizing nature as a partner in your own individual health, uh, will ultimately lead to stewardship of, uh, of, uh, of land. And I think it's all connected in a large chain. Uh, and so, you know, I think that as we continue to, it's almost a, a different approach to trying to get to the same conclusion. Um, if people recognize that the land is an important part of their overall health and wellness, it's likely, more likely, that they'll play a role in pre protecting and preserving that land and keeping it healthy. And so um, I think they're part of the same message. Ultimately, it's just a different way of approaching it to a, toward the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. and we've got another one from Eric, who's also interested in how the healthcare and insurance systems can support what he's calling true group interventions outside with limited CPT codes and reimbursement for shared medical appointments. Yeah, it's actually very interesting you're talking about that because for the first time we're seeing insurance companies, you may read about this uh, on a daily basis, um, you know, insurance companies are starting to recognize these enhancements to uh, their plans that will address the social determinants of health. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are a number of insurance companies that are reimbursing rides with, uh, uh, with Uber and Lyft so that people can get to their appointments. These are not necessarily insurance benefits per se. Uh, Kaiser has invested in a lot of public housing. Uh, fresh food pharmacies are popping up uh, all over the place. And I think a lot of systems are recognizing that. I think it behooves us to try to create a new package or a new uh, intervention that says maybe access to a park or access to nature is, uh, is part of that uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, benefit. Now, the issue that comes up with that is that the other items that I said are part of social determinants tend to cost people money. And maybe this is our problem is that we've made, it, we've made access to parks and things free and therefore it's hard for insurance companies to try to find a way to pay for it. Uh, but I do think there's a value equation in there uh, somewhere. And in fact, Christian and the rest of the team up at Chef uh, with myself are trying to figure out new packages in order to create uh, um, uh, ways that we can entice insurance companies to provide funding for these types of things. Um, in, a, in a kind of a future world, it would be great if we could have uh, insurance companies take advantage or at least recognize the, the role they play in community health and that part of that community health is land stewardship and then all of a sudden part of the money that comes from the health insurance of the population gets used, gets used to fund the health of a park and that relates to another question that came earlier uh, and that would make I'm sure a lot of folks on this uh, webinar's lives a lot easier. That's great and I see one from Ellie Stevens that I think I might be able to help answer. And she's asking about the best way to connect to potential partners in her area that may want to work together. And that's really been one of the central conundrums is everybody, um, there's so many folks who are working on these issues around the country, but as often as not, they're working in isolation. So this was the impetus for the, um, the catalyst for the Slack channel that the researchers developed last year. So Ellie, you could go to uh, Slack Nature Health and that's one way to have a conversation with a broader community. And from there, you might be able to begin drilling down into your own community. <clears throat> and then Heather Pashier has a good one. What recommendations do you have for outdoor rec planners? Yeah, it's, a, it's the, probably the most common question that I get when I give these talks because, and I, I, I get it. It is, you know, um, you can hear a talk about the benefits of nature and being outside and all of us 
who participate in things, we get it. Uh, it's nice to have additional science and it's nice to have these additional recommendations. But when it really comes down to brass tacks, it's, it's like, what do I do next? And so the, the advice that I give to people is that, again, it's partly defining what the community is and start uh, and look at what is a reasonable set of projects and who are the reasonable healthcare partners in the area. And then identifying potential champions because physicians speak a different language when it comes to uh, getting the healthcare community involved. It's a different approach than when I go, or if Christian and I went to Aetna, uh, and if Christian went by himself, they'd say, enjoy our lobby for a little while. If I go and I'm speaking on behalf of a group of physicians or a movement, it tends to be a little different because we speak that language. So having a physician champion is actually really, really important. And I'm pretty confident that there are champions all over the place uh, in our local communities. And getting them further engaged to see that this is important. I always put myself out there as a resource to be able to talk to any of them to see how we can uh, continue to build the movement. But finding a, uh, defining the community, identifying your healthcare uh, partners, and then potentially finding a physician champion are probably the three most important things you can do to get something started locally. Thank you. We've got time, time for one more, and it's from Julie Isbell. Is there a collaboration somewhere in the U.S. that you could point to as a great model? For making change and improving a community's health through nature? Not yet. Coming <laughs> soon. So here at uh, my own institution at, uh, at Geisinger uh, in central Pennsylvania, we have a tremendous amount of resources when it comes to outdoor rec. Uh, I'm championing a, a series of interventions that I think are going to be very important for our local communities. Uh, working with local state parks and also our state parks commissioner uh, in the uh, state of Pennsylvania to help design uh, new areas where we can actually not necessarily prescribe prescriptions, but recognize the connection between nature uh, and uh, health individually, and then work with the large insurance companies to see if we can create a benefit uh, to actually being participant in that insurance company as well. But again, one of the conundrums that I have is that when everything is free, they treat you as if you have no value. Uh, and so the more we make parks accessible and things like that, sometimes it hurts our ability to create people who want to pay for it. So uh, that's one of the things I'd love your advice and anyone on the phone who could, uh, uh, could, uh, could help uh, provide any input on that. Dr. Sook, thanks so much. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Vera Pongsi right now to help wrap, up, wrap it up. Thank you so much for that presentation, Michael. That was just, that was wonderful. I loved hearing that overview of really giving us that, that really great 30,000 foot view of, of, um, of, of our topic and of the movement. And thank you so much, Christian, also for moderating um, all of those great questions. I love seeing that there are so many questions from you all because this is part of the goal of this webinar series is to try to bring access to different stakeholders to cross, to cross sectoral um, uh, participants so that we can all get a better perspective of how other sectors are treating the same issue. Um, and so we really look forward to having you all at the next webinar. So the next webinar will be by Linda Wang and she's gonna be representing the environment um, land management perspective that will I think be really complimentary to what you presented today, Michael. Um, and um, so, so to, if you want to, so to see the webinar again, I'm just going to put up some resources here um, that this is where the webinar recording will be. Um, I'm also just gonna pop it into the chat so, so you guys will all have it, but also know that we are going to have, you all will be, will be sending you a follow-up email. Um, I'm gonna reach out to, to Michael and make sure that we get his reference list as well as some, he, he also offered some references around um, the language and terminology. Um, that 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 we can use as we as we communicate. Um, let me just pop these. Just being aware that these links are not you can't click on them. Um, and um, and so just to get some shift announcements. Also, is that the um, Emerging Leaders Program for Shift is accepting applications. If you don't know about that program, you should definitely look online and and you can contact um, Dr. Morgan Green about that. Also, the nominations for SHIFT awards are open. Self-nominations are welcome. Um, so you can contact Arian at SHIFT. And then the SHIFT Summit, the annual summit that SHIFT holds in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, will be held in October, mid-October. And please also join our Slack community. That link is also there in the chat box as well. And if you have any questions about the webinar series itself, um, you can contact me. 
So I would like to thank you all for being here for our first webinar. We are so excited about this series. Um, after this, after Linda Wang's presentation later this month, we are also going to move on into the public health chapter, chapter number two. So it's another opportunity to ask more of these questions about public health specifically. Um, and this webinar series will culminate to in September to kick off into the shift summit that will be held in October. So we hope to see you again at this um, webinar and thank you so much for joining us.